This is a devotional book by Ellen G. White. Conflict and Courage. Part 11. November. He said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. From the first, Peter had believed Jesus to be the Messiah. Many others who had been convicted by the preaching of John the Baptist, and had accepted Christ, began to doubt as to John's mission when he was imprisoned and put to death, and they now doubted that Jesus was the Messiah, for whom they had looked so long. But Peter and his companions turned not from their allegiance. The vacillating course of those who praised yesterday and condemned today did not destroy the faith of the true follower of the Saviour. Peter had expressed the faith of the Twelve. Yet the disciples were still far from understanding Christ's mission. The opposition and misrepresentation of the priests and rulers, while it could not turn them away from Christ, still caused them great perplexity. From time to time precious rays of light from Jesus shone upon them, yet often they were like men groping among shadows. But on this day, before they were brought face to face with the great trial of their faith, the Holy Spirit rested upon them in power. For a little time their eyes were turned away from the things which are seen, to behold the things which are not seen. Beneath the guise of humanity they discerned the glory of the Son of God. The truth which Peter had confessed is the foundation of the believer's faith. It is that which Christ Himself has declared to be eternal life. But the possession of this knowledge was no ground for self-glorification. Through no wisdom or goodness of His own had it been revealed to Peter. Never can humanity, of itself, attain to a knowledge of the divine. It is as high as heaven, what can you do? Deeper than hell, what can you know? Only the spirit of adoption can reveal to us the deep things of God, which eye has not seen, not ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. But He turned, and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense unto me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Satan is ever intruding himself between the soul of man and God. This lesson in regard to Peter needs to be studied carefully. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. The impression which his words would make was directly opposed to that which Christ desired to make on the minds of his followers. And the Saviour was moved to utter one of the sternest rebukes that ever fell from his lips. Satan was trying to discourage Jesus, and turn him from his mission, and Peter, in his blind love, was giving voice to the temptation. The Prince of Evil was the author of the thought. His instigation was behind that impulsive appeal. He was seeking to fix Peter's gaze upon the earthly glory, that he might not behold the cross to which Jesus desired to turn his eyes. And through Peter, Satan was again pressing the temptation upon Jesus. But the Saviour heeded it not, his thought was for his disciple. Satan had interposed between Peter and his Master, that the heart of the disciple might not be touched at the vision of Christ's humiliation for him. The words of Christ were spoken, not to Peter, but to the one who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get behind me, Satan! No longer interpose between me and my erring servant. Let me come face to face with Peter, that I may reveal to him the mystery of my love. It was to Peter a bitter lesson, and one which he learned but slowly, that the path of Christ on earth lay through agony and humiliation. The disciple shrank from fellowship with his Lord in suffering. But in the heat of the furnace fire he was to learn its blessing. Long afterward, when his active form was bowed with the burden of years and labors, he wrote, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that, when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Bold, aggressive, and self-confident, quick to perceive and forward to act, prompt in retaliation yet generous in forgiving, Peter often erred, and often received reproof. 
nor were his warm-hearted loyalty and devotion to Christ the less decidedly recognized and commended. Patiently, with discriminating love, the Savior dealt with his impetuous disciple, seeking to check his self-confidence, and to teach him humility, obedience, and trust. But only in part was the lesson learned. Over and over again was given the warning, You shall deny that you know me. It was the grieved, loving heart of the disciple that spoke out in the avowal, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both into prison and to death. When in the judgment hall the words of denial had been spoken, when Peter's love and loyalty, awakened under the Saviour's glance of pity and love and sorrow, had sent him forth to the garden where Christ had wept and prayed, when his tears of remorse dropped upon the sod that had been moistened with the blood drops of his agony, then the Saviour's words, I have prayed for you were a stay to his soul. Christ, though foreseeing his sin, had not abandoned him to despair. If the look that Jesus cast upon him had spoken condemnation instead of pity, if in foretelling the sin he had failed of speaking hope, how dense would have been the darkness that encompassed Peter. He who could not spare his disciple the anguish, left him not alone to its bitterness. His is a love that fails not nor forsakes. Human beings, themselves given to evil, are prone to deal untenderly with the tempted and the erring. They cannot read the heart, they know not its struggle and pain. Of the rebuke that is love, of the blow that wounds to heal, of the warning that speaks hope, they have need to learn. A miracle of divine tenderness was Peter's transformation. It is a life lesson to all who seek to follow in the steps of the Master Teacher. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. James and John presented through their mother a petition requesting that they might be permitted to occupy the highest positions of honor in Christ's kingdom. Notwithstanding Christ's repeated instruction concerning the nature of his kingdom, these young disciples still cherished the hope for a Messiah who would take his throne and kingly power in accordance with the desires of men. But the Saviour answered, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They recalled his mysterious words pointing to trial and suffering. Yet answered confidently, We are able. They would count it highest honor to prove their loyalty by sharing all that was to befall their Lord. You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, Christ declared. James and John were to be sharers with their master in suffering, the one, destined to swift coming death by the sword, the other, longest of all the disciples to follow his master in labor and reproach and persecution. But to sit on my right hand, and on my left, he continued, is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. In the kingdom of God, position is not gained through favoritism. It is not earned, nor is it received through an arbitrary bestowal. It is the result of character. The crown and the throne are the tokens of a condition attained, tokens of self-conquest through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who stands nearest to Christ will be he who has drunk most deeply of his spirit of self-sacrificing love. Love that vaunts not itself, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, love that moves the disciple, as it moved our Lord, to give all, to live and labor and sacrifice even unto death, for the saving of humanity. We love him, because he first loved us. John is distinguished above the other apostles as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He received many tokens of the Savior's confidence and love. He was one of the three permitted to witness Christ's glory upon the Mount of Transfiguration and His agony in Gethsemane, and it was to His care that our Lord confided His mother in those last hours of anguish upon the cross. John's was a nature that longed for love, for sympathy and companionship. He pressed close to Jesus, sat by his side, leaned upon his breast. As a flower the sun and dew, so did he drink in the divine light and life. The depth and fervor of John's affection for his master was not the cause of Christ's love for him, but the effect of that love. John desired to become like Jesus, and under the transforming influence of the love of Christ he did become meek and lowly. Self was hid in Jesus. Above all his companions, John yielded himself to the power of that wondrous life. 
John knew the Savior by an experimental knowledge. His Master's lessons were graven on his soul. When he testified of the Savior's grace, his simple language was eloquent with the love that pervaded his whole being. It was John's deep love for Christ which led him always to desire to be close by his side. The Savior loved all the twelve, but John's was the most receptive spirit. He was younger than the others, and with more of the child's confiding trust he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus he came more into sympathy with Christ, and through him the Savior's deepest spiritual teaching was communicated to the people. John could talk of the Father's love as no other of the disciples could. He revealed to his fellow men that which he felt in his own soul, representing in his character the attributes of God. The beauty of holiness which had transformed him shone with a Christ-like radiance from his countenance. In adoration and love he beheld the Savior until likeness to Christ and fellowship with him became his one desire, and in his character was reflected the character of his Master. He that says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. In the life of the disciple John true sanctification is exemplified. During the years of his close association with Christ, he was often warned and cautioned by the Savior. And these reproofs he accepted. As the character of the Divine One was manifested to him, John saw his own deficiencies, and was humbled by the revelation. The power and tenderness, the majesty and meekness, the strength and patience, that he saw in the daily life of the Son of God, filled his soul with admiration. He yielded his resentful, ambitious temper to the molding power of Christ, and divine love wrought in him a transformation of character. In striking contrast to the sanctification worked out in the life of John is the experience of his fellow disciple, Judas. John warred earnestly against his faults, but Judas violated his conscience and yielded to temptation, fastening upon himself more securely his habits of evil. John and Judas are representatives of those who profess to be Christ's followers. Both these disciples had the same opportunities to study and follow the divine pattern. Both were closely associated with Jesus and were privileged to listen to his teaching. Each possessed serious defects of character, and each had access to the divine grace that transforms character. But while one in humility was learning of Jesus, the other revealed that he was not a doer of the word, but a hearer only. One, daily dying to self and overcoming sin, was sanctified through the truth, the other, resisting the transforming power of grace and indulging selfish desires, was brought into bondage to Satan. Such transformation of character as is seen in the life of John is ever the result of communion with Christ. There may be marked defects in the character of an individual, yet when he becomes a true disciple of Christ, the power of divine grace transforms and sanctifies him. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, he is changed from glory to glory, until he is like him whom he adores. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests, and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it had become the ruling motive of his life. The love of mammon overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice he gave himself to Satan. Judas was highly regarded by the disciples, and had great influence over them. He himself had a high opinion of his own qualifications, and looked upon his brethren as greatly inferior to him in judgment and ability. They did not see their opportunities, he thought, and take advantage of circumstances. The church would never prosper with such short-sighted men as leaders. Peter was impetuous, he would move without consideration. John, who was treasuring up the truths that fell from Christ's lips, was looked upon by Judas as a poor financier. Matthew, whose training had taught him accuracy in all things, was very particular in regard to honesty. And he was ever contemplating the words of Christ, and became so absorbed in them that, as Judas thought, he could not be trusted to do sharp, far-seeing business. Thus Judas summed up all the disciples, and flattered himself that the church would often be brought into perplexity and embarrassment if it were not for his ability as a manager. 
the history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Had Judas died before his last journey to Jerusalem he would have been regarded as a man worthy of a place among the twelve, and one who would be greatly missed. The abhorrence which has followed him through the centuries would not have existed but for the attributes revealed at the close of his history. But it was for a purpose that his character was laid open to the world. It was to be a warning to all who, like him, should betray sacred trusts. For thirty pieces of silver, the price of a slave, he sold the Lord of glory to ignominy and death. Not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not all who profess to be workers for Christ are true disciples. Among those who bear his name, and who are even numbered with his workers, are some who do not represent him in character. Till the end of time there will be tares among the wheat. In his mercy and long-suffering, God bears patiently with the perverse and even the false-hearted. Among Christ's chosen apostles was Judas the traitor. Should it then be a cause of surprise or discouragement that there are false-hearted ones among his workers today? If he who reads the heart could bear with him who he knew was to be his betrayer, with what patience should we bear with those at fault? And not all, even of those who appear most faulty, are like Judas. Peter, impetuous, hasty, and self-confident, often appeared to far greater disadvantage than Judas did. He was oftener reproved by the Saviour. But what a life of service and sacrifice was his! What a testimony does it bear to the power of God's grace! Christ connected Judas and impulsive Peter with himself, not because Judas was covetous and Peter passionate, but that they might learn of him, their great teacher, and become, like him, unselfish, meek, and lowly of heart. He saw good material in both these men. Judas possessed financial ability and would have been of value to the church had he taken home to his heart the lessons which Christ was giving by rebuking all selfishness. Fraud, and avarice, even in the little matters of life. The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity because there are unworthy members in the church, nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. How was it with the early church? Ananias and Sapphira joined themselves to the disciples. Simon Magus was baptized. Judas Iscariot was numbered with the apostles. The Redeemer does not want to lose one soul, his experience with Judas is recorded to show his long patience with perverse human nature, and he bids us bear with it as he has borne. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. The disciples knew nothing of the purpose of Judas. Jesus alone could read his secret. Yet he did not expose him. Jesus hungered for his soul. His heart was crying, How can I give you up? The constraining power of that love was felt by Judas. When the Saviour's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping them with the towel, the heart of Judas thrilled through and through with the impulse. Then and there, to confess his sin but he would not humble himself. He hardened his heart against repentance, and the old impulses, for the moment put aside, again controlled him. Judas was now offended at Christ's act in washing the feet of his disciples. If Jesus could so humble himself, he thought, he could not be Israel's king. All hope of worldly honor in a temporal kingdom was destroyed. Judas was satisfied that there was nothing to be gained by following Christ. He was possessed by a demon, and he resolved to complete the work he had agreed to do in betraying his Lord. Judas the betrayer was present at the sacramental service. He received from Jesus the emblems of his broken body and his spilled blood. He heard the words, This do in remembrance of me. And sitting there in the very presence of the Lamb of God, the betrayer brooded upon his own dark purposes, and cherished his sullen, revengeful thoughts. At the Passover supper Jesus proved his divinity by revealing the traitor's purpose. He tenderly included Judas in the ministry to the disciples. But the last appeal of love was unheeded. Then the case of Judas was decided, and the feet that Jesus had washed went forth to the betrayer's work. Until this step was taken, 
Judas had not passed beyond the possibility of repentance. But when he left the presence of his Lord and his fellow disciples, the final decision had been made. He had passed the boundary line. How many today are, like Judas, betraying their Lord? Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how do you say then, Show us the Father? At the head of one of the groups into which the apostles are divided stands the name of Philip. He was the first disciple to whom Jesus addressed the distinct command. Follow me. He had listened to the teaching of John the Baptist, and had heard his announcement of Christ as the Lamb of God. Philip was a sincere seeker for truth, but he was slow of heart to believe. Though Christ had been proclaimed by the voice from heaven as the Son of God, to Philip he was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, when the five thousand were fed, Philip's lack of faith was shown. It was to test him that Jesus questioned, Whence shall we buy bread, that these may eat? Again, in those last hours before the crucifixion, the words of Philip were such as to discourage faith. So slow of heart, so weak in faith, was that disciple who for three years had been with Jesus. He wished Christ to reveal the Father in bodily form, but in Christ God had already revealed Himself. Is it possible, Christ said, that after walking with me, hearing my words, seeing the miracle of feeding the five thousand, of healing the sick of the dread disease leprosy, of bringing the dead to life, of raising Lazarus, who was a prey to death, whose body had indeed seen corruption, you do not know me? Is it possible that you do not discern the Father in the works that He does by me? God cannot be seen in external form by any human being. Christ alone can represent the Father to humanity. In happy contrast to Philip's unbelief was the childlike trust of Nathaniel. He was a man of intensely earnest nature, one whose faith took hold upon unseen realities. Yet Philip was a student in the school of Christ, and the divine teacher bore patiently with his unbelief and dullness. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples, Philip became a teacher after the divine order. He knew whereof he spoke, and he taught with an assurance that carried conviction to the hearers. Wherefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. When Christ on the eve of his betrayal forewarned his disciples, All you shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I, Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation, but in a few short hours the test came, and with cursing and swearing he denied his Lord. Peter had not designed that his real character should be known. In assuming an air of indifference he had placed himself on the enemy's ground, and he became an easy prey to temptation. If he had been called to fight for his master, he would have been a courageous soldier, but when the finger of scorn was pointed at him, he proved himself a coward. Many who do not shrink from active warfare for their Lord are driven by ridicule to deny their faith. By associating with those whom they should avoid, they place themselves in the way of temptation. They invite the enemy to tempt them, and are led to say and do that of which under other circumstances they would never have been guilty. The disciple of Christ who in our day disguises his faith through dread of suffering or reproach denies his Lord as really as did Peter in the judgment hall. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done he turned and looked at his master. At that moment Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him were blended, Peter understood himself. He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ's broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he repent his sin. Now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. It was through self-sufficiency that Peter fell. And it was through repentance and humiliation that his feet were again established. In the record of his experience every repenting sinner may find encouragement. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? This heart-searching question was necessary in the case of Peter, and it is necessary in our case. The work of restoration can never be thorough unless the roots of evil are reached. Again and again the shoots have been clipped, 
while the root of bitterness has been left to spring up and defile many, but the very depth of the hidden evil must be reached. When, the third time, Christ said to Peter, Do you love me? The probe reached the soul center. Self-judged, Peter fell upon the rock, saying, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. This is the work before every soul who has dishonored God, and grieved the heart of Christ, by a denial of truth and righteousness. If the tempted soul endures the trying process, and self does not awake to life to feel hurt and abused under the test, that probing knife reveals that the soul is indeed dead to self, but alive unto God. Some assert that if a soul stumbles and falls, he can never regain his position, but the case before us contradicts this. In committing to his stewardship the souls for whom he had given his life, Christ gave to Peter the strongest evidence of his confidence in his restoration. And he was commissioned to feed not only the sheep, but the lambs, a broader and more delicate work than had hitherto been appointed him. Peter was now humble enough to understand the words of Christ, and without further questioning, the once restless, boastful, self-confident disciple became subdued and contrite. He followed his Lord indeed, the Lord he had denied. The thought that Christ had not denied and rejected him was to Peter a light and comfort and blessing. He felt that he could be crucified from choice, but it must be with his head downward. And he who was so close a partaker of Christ's sufferings will also be a partaker of his glory when he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. It was the custom among the Jews for the garments to be rent at the death of friends, but this custom the priests were not to observe. Everything worn by the priest was to be whole and without blemish. By those beautiful official garments was represented the character of the great antitype, Jesus Christ. Nothing but perfection, in dress and attitude, in word and spirit, could be acceptable to God. He is holy, and His glory and perfection must be represented by the earthly service. Finite man might rend his own heart by showing a contrite and humble spirit. This God would discern. But no rent must be made in the priestly robes, for this would mar the representation of heavenly things. When Christ declared Himself the Son of God, Caiaphas, in pretended horror, rent His robe, and accused the Holy One of Israel of blasphemy. He had done the very thing that the Lord had commanded should not be done. Standing under the condemnation of God, he pronounced sentence on Christ as a blasphemer. The priestly robe he rent in order to impress the people with his horror of the sin of blasphemy covered a heart full of wickedness. How different was the true high priest from the false and corrupted Caiaphas! Christ stood before the false high priest, pure and undefiled, without a taint of sin. Christ mourned for the transgression of every human being. He bore even the guiltiness of Caiaphas, knowing the hypocrisy that dwelt in his soul, while for pretense he rent his robe. Christ did not rend his robe, but his soul was rent. His garment of human flesh was rent as he hung on the cross, the sin-bearer of the race. Many today who claim to be Christians are in danger of rending their garments, making an outward show of repentance, when their hearts are not softened nor subdued. This is why so many continue to make failures in the Christian life. An outward appearance of sorrow is shown for wrong, but their repentance is not that which needs not to be repented of. When Pilate realized that nothing more could be done but that there would soon be a riot, he took a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I take no responsibility for the death of this man. You must see to that yourselves. If at the first Pilate had stood firm, refusing to condemn a man whom he found guiltless, he would have broken the fatal chain that was to bind him in remorse and guilt as long as he lived. Had he carried out his convictions of right, the Jews would not have presumed to dictate to him. Christ would have been put to death, but the guilt would not have rested upon Pilate. But Pilate had taken step after step in the violation of his conscience. He had excused himself from judging with justice and equity, and he now found himself almost helpless in the hands of the priests and rulers. His wavering and indecision proved his ruin. In fear and self-condemnation Pilate looked upon the Saviour. In the vast sea of upturned faces, his alone was peaceful. About his head a soft light seemed to shine. 
Pilate said in his heart, He is a god. Turning to the multitude he declared, I am clear of his blood. Take you him, and crucify him. But I pronounce him a just man. May he whom he claims as his father judge you and not me for this day's work. Then to Jesus he said, Forgive me for this act, I cannot save you. Pilate longed to deliver Jesus. But he saw that he could not do this, and yet retain his own position and honor. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many, to escape loss or suffering, in like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way, and self-interest points another. Pilate yielded to the demands of the mob. Rather than risk losing his position, he delivered Jesus up to be crucified. But the very thing he dreaded afterward came upon him. His honors were stripped from him, he was cast down from his high office, and, stung by remorse and wounded pride, not long after the crucifixion he ended his own life. So all who compromise with sin will gain only sorrow and ruin. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus had hardly passed the gate of Pilate's house when the cross which had been prepared for Barabbas was brought out and laid upon his bruised and bleeding shoulders. He had borne his burden but a few rods, when, from loss of blood and excessive weariness and pain, he fell fainting to the ground. When he revived, the cross was again placed upon his shoulders, and he was forced forward. He staggered on for a few steps, bearing his heavy load, and then fell as one lifeless to the ground. The priests and rulers felt no compassion for their suffering victim, but they saw that it was impossible for him to carry the instrument of torture farther. They were puzzled to find anyone who would humiliate himself to bear the cross to the place of execution. The crowd that followed the Saviour to Calvary taunted and reviled him because he could not carry the wooden cross. They all saw the weak and staggering steps of Christ, but compassion did not reveal itself in the hearts of those who had advanced from one step to another in their abuse and torture of the Son of God. A stranger, Simon, a Cyrenian, coming to the city from the country, hears the crowd pass the taunts and ribaldry, he hears the contemptuous repetition, Make way for the King of the Jews. He stops in astonishment at the scene, and as he expresses his compassion in words and deeds, they seize him and compel him to lift the cross which is too heavy for Christ to bear. That wooden cross borne by him to Calvary was the means of Simon taking upon himself the cross of Christ from choice, to ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. His compulsory companionship with Christ in bearing his cross to Calvary, in beholding the sad and dreadful work and the spectators beneath the cross, was the means of drawing his heart to Jesus. Every word from the lips of Christ was graven upon his soul. And the heart of Simon believed. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To Jesus in his agony on the cross there came one gleam of comfort. It was the prayer of the penitent thief. This man was not a hardened criminal, he had been led astray by evil associations. He had seen and heard Jesus, and had been convicted by his teaching, but he had been turned away from him by the priests and rulers. Seeking to stifle conviction, he had plunged deeper and deeper into sin, until he was arrested, tried as a criminal, and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to Calvary he had been in company with Jesus. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in him. He had marked his godlike bearing, and his pitying forgiveness of his tormentors. The conviction comes back to him that this is the Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal he says, Don't you fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? The dying thieves have no longer anything to fear from man. But upon one of them presses the conviction that there is a God to fear, a future to cause him to tremble. And now, all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to close. When condemned for his crime, the thief had become hopeless and despairing, but strange, tender thoughts now spring up. He calls to mind all he has heard of Jesus. The Holy Spirit illuminates his mind, and little by little the chain of evidence is joined together. 
In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the cross, He sees the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Hope is mingled with anguish in His voice as the helpless, dying soul casts himself upon a dying Savior. Lord, remember me, He cries, when you come into your kingdom. Quickly the answer came. Soft and melodious the tone, full of love, compassion, and power the words, Verily I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. To the penitent thief came the perfect peace of acceptance with God. Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Neither Joseph nor Nicodemus had openly accepted the Saviour while he was living. They knew that such a step would exclude them from the Sanhedrin. And they hoped to protect him by their influence in its councils. For a time they had seemed to succeed, but the wily priests, seeing their favour to Christ, had thwarted their plans. In their absence Jesus had been condemned and delivered to be crucified. Now that he was dead, they no longer concealed their attachment to him. While the disciples feared to show themselves openly as his followers, Joseph and Nicodemus came boldly to their aid. Nicodemus, when he saw Jesus lifted up on the cross, remembered his words spoken by night in the Mount of Olives, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. But have eternal life. On that Sabbath, when Christ lay in the grave, Nicodemus had opportunity for reflection. A clearer light now illuminated his mind, and the words which Jesus had spoken to him were no longer mysterious. He felt that he had lost much by not connecting himself with the Saviour during his life. Now he recalled the events of Calvary. The prayer of Christ for his murderers and his answer to the petition of the dying thief spoke to the heart of the learned counsellor. Again he looked upon the Saviour in his agony, again he heard that last cry, It is finished, spoken like the words of a conqueror. Again he beheld the reeling earth, the darkened heavens, the rent veil, the shivered rocks, and his faith was forever established. The very event that destroyed the hopes of the disciples convinced Joseph and Nicodemus of the divinity of Jesus. Their fears were overcome by the courage of a firm and unwavering faith. Jesus says unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, blessed are they that have not seen. And yet have believed. When Jesus first met the disciples in the upper chamber, following his resurrection, Thomas was not with them. He heard the reports of the others, and received abundant proof that Jesus had risen, but gloom and unbelief filled his heart. He was determined not to believe, and for a whole week he brooded over his wretchedness, which seemed all the darker in contrast with the hope and faith of his brethren. He ardently loved his Lord, but he had allowed jealousy and unbelief to take possession of his mind and heart. He firmly and self-confidently affirmed that he would not believe unless he should put his fingers in the prints of the nails and his hand in the side where the cruel spear was thrust. When Jesus again met with his disciples, Thomas was with them. And Jesus gave him the evidence which he had desired. His heart leaped for joy, and he cast himself at the feet of Jesus crying, My Lord and my God. Jesus accepted his acknowledgement, but gently reproved his unbelief. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed, will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. In his treatment of Thomas, Jesus gave a lesson for his followers. His example shows how we should treat those whose faith is weak, and who make their doubts prominent. Jesus did not overwhelm Thomas with reproach, nor did he enter into controversy with him. He revealed himself to the doubting one. Thomas had been most unreasonable in dictating the conditions of his faith, but Jesus, by his generous love and consideration, broke down all the barriers. Unbelief is seldom overcome by controversy. But let Jesus, in his love and mercy, be revealed as the crucified Saviour. And from many once unwilling lips will be heard the acknowledgement of Thomas, 
my Lord and my God. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. On the day following the healing of the cripple, Annas and Caiaphas, with the other dignitaries of the temple, met together for the trial, and the prisoners, Peter and John, were brought before them. In that very room and before some of those very men, Peter had shamefully denied his Lord. This came distinctly to his mind as he appeared for his own trial. He now had an opportunity of redeeming his cowardice. But the Peter who denied Christ in the hour of his greatest need was impulsive and self-confident, differing widely from the Peter who was brought before the Sanhedrin for examination. Since his fall he had been converted. He was no longer proud and boastful, but modest and self-distrustful. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and by the help of this power he was resolved to remove the stain of his apostasy by honoring the name he had once disowned. The principle for which the disciples stood so fearlessly when, in answer to the command not to speak any more in the name of Jesus, they declared, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge for yourselves, is the same that the adherents of the gospel struggled to maintain in the days of the Reformation. This principle we in our day are firmly to maintain. The banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the Gospel Church and by God's witnesses during the centuries that have passed since then, has, in this last conflict, been committed to our hands. We are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment, and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty, within its legitimate sphere. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. God's word must be recognized as above all human legislation. A thus says the Lord is not to be set aside for a thus says the church or a thus says the state. The crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentates. When you shall vow a vow unto the Lord your God, you shall not slack to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you. The brief but terrible history of Ananias and Sapphira is traced by the pen of inspiration for the benefit of all who profess to be the followers of Christ. This important lesson has not rested with sufficient weight upon the minds of our people. This one marked evidence of God's retributive justice is fearful, and should lead all to fear and tremble to repeat sins which brought such a punishment. Ananias and his wife Sapphira had the privilege of hearing the gospel preached by the apostles. While under the direct influence of the Spirit of God, they made a pledge to give to the Lord certain lands, but when they were no longer under this heavenly influence, the impression was less forcible, and they began to question and draw back from fulfilling the pledge which they had made. Covetousness was first cherished, then, ashamed to have their brethren know that their selfish souls grudged that which they had solemnly dedicated and pledged to God, deception was practiced. When convicted of their falsehood, their punishment was instant death. Not to the early church only, but to all future generations, this example of God's hatred of covetousness, fraud, and hypocrisy, was given as a danger signal. When the heart is stirred by the influence of the Holy Spirit, and a vow is made to give a certain amount, the one who vows has no longer any right to the consecrated portion. Promises of this kind made to men would be looked upon as binding, are those not more binding that are made to God. Many spend money lavishly in self-gratification. Men and women consult their pleasure and gratify their taste, while they bring to God, almost unwillingly, a stinted offering. They forget that God will one day demand a strict account of how His goods have been used, and that He will no more accept the pittance they hand into the treasury than He accepted the offering of Ananias and Sapphira. And all that sat in the council. Looking steadfastly on Him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Stephen, the foremost of the seven deacons, was a man of deep piety and broad faith. He was very active in the cause of Christ and boldly proclaimed his faith. Learned rabbis and doctors of the law engaged in public discussion with him, confidently expecting an easy victory. But they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. As the priests and rulers saw the power that attended the preaching of Stephen, they were filled with bitter hatred. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin council for trial. 
Saul of Tarsus was present and took a leading part against Stephen. He brought the weight of eloquence and the logic of the rabbis to bear upon the case, to convince the people that Stephen was preaching delusive and dangerous doctrines, but in Stephen he met one who had a full understanding of the purpose of God in the spreading of the gospel to other nations. In the cruel faces about him the prisoner read his fate, but he did not waver. For him the fear of death was gone. For him the enraged priests and the excited mob had no terror. The scene before him faded from his vision. To him the gates of heaven were ajar, and, looking in, he saw the glory of the courts of God, and Christ, as if just risen from his throne, standing ready to sustain his servant. In every age God's chosen messengers have been reviled and persecuted, yet through their affliction the knowledge of God has been spread abroad. When the noble and eloquent Stephen was stoned to death there was no loss to the cause of the gospel. The light of heaven that glorified his face, the divine compassion breathed in his dying prayer, were as a sharp arrow of conviction to the bigoted Sanhedrist who stood by, and Saul, the persecuting Pharisee, became a chosen vessel to bear the name of Christ before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. Notice how much effort was put forth for just one man, an Ethiopian. This Ethiopian was a man of good standing and of wide influence. God saw that when converted he would give others the light he had received and would exert a strong influence in favor of the gospel. Angels of God were attending this seeker for light, and he was being drawn to the Savior. By the ministration of the Holy Spirit the Lord brought him into touch with one who could lead him to the light. Philip was directed to go to the Ethiopian and explain to him the prophecy that he was reading. Go near, the Spirit said, and join yourself to this chariot. The man's heart thrilled with interest as the scriptures were explained to him, and when the disciple had finished, he was ready to accept the light given. He did not make his high worldly position an excuse for refusing the gospel. This Ethiopian represented a large class who need to be taught by such missionaries as Philip, men who will hear the voice of God and go where he sends them. There are many who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. All over the world men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel, and today angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. He who sent Philip to the Ethiopian counselor, Peter to the Roman centurion, and the little Israelitish maiden to the help of Naaman, the Syrian captain, sends men and women and youth today as his representatives to those in need of divine help and guidance. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and almsdeeds which she did. At Joppa, which was near Lydda, there lived a woman named Dorcas, whose good deeds had made her greatly beloved. She was a worthy disciple of Jesus, and her life was filled with acts of kindness. She knew who needed comfortable clothing and who needed sympathy, and she freely ministered to the poor and the sorrowful. And it came to pass in those days, that she was sick, and died. Hearing that Peter was at Lydda, the believers sent messengers to him. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made, while she was with them. The apostle's heart was touched with sympathy as he beheld their sorrow. Then, directing that the weeping friends be sent from the room, he knelt down and prayed fervently to God to restore Dorcas to life and health. Dorcas had been of great service to the church, and God saw fit to bring her back from the land of the enemy, that her skill and energy might still be a blessing to others, and also that by this manifestation of his power the cause of Christ might be strengthened. Let the children and youth learn from the Bible how God has honored the work of the everyday twaller. Let them read of Jesus the carpenter, and Paul the tent maker, who with the toil of the craftsmen linked the highest ministry, human and divine. 
Let them read of the lad whose five loaves were used by the Saviour in that wonderful miracle for the feeding of the multitude. Of Dorcas the seamstress, called back from death, that she might continue to make garments for the poor, of the wise woman described in the Proverbs, who seeks wool and flax, and works willingly with her hands. Who stretches out her hand to the poor, yes, reaches forth her hands to the needy. Of such a one, God says. She shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, he lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell you what you have to do. The explicitness of these directions, in which was named even the occupation of the man with whom Peter was staying, shows that heaven is acquainted with the history and business of men in every station of life. God is familiar with the experience and work of the humble laborer, as well as with that of the king upon his throne. My heart is made very tender as I read of the interest manifested by the Lord in Cornelius. Cornelius was a man in high position, an officer in the Roman army, but he was walking in strict accordance with all the light he had received. The Lord sent a special message from heaven to him, and by another message directed Peter to visit him and give him light. Cornelius was gladly obedient to the vision. Thus was the gospel brought to those who had been strangers and foreigners, making them fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The conversion of Cornelius and his household was but the first fruits of a harvest to be gathered in. From this household a widespread work of grace was carried on in that heathen city. Today God is seeking for souls among the high as well as the lowly. There are many like Cornelius, men whom the Lord desires to connect with His work in the world. Their sympathies are with the Lord's people, but the ties that bind them to the world hold them firmly. It requires moral courage for them to take their position for Christ. Special efforts should be made for these souls, who are in so great danger, because of their responsibilities and associations. From the story of Cornelius we learn that God will lead everyone who is willing to be led. He led Cornelius. He drew out his servant's heart in prayer. He prepared him to receive the light of his truth, and he chose to enlighten the mind of Cornelius through the agency of one who had already received light from above. Peter began, I now see how true it is that God has no favorites, but that in every nation the man who is God-fearing and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter was called by God to take the gospel to Cornelius. As yet none of the disciples had preached the gospel to the Gentiles. In their minds the middle wall of partition, broken down by the death of Christ, still existed, and their labors had been confined to the Jews, for they had looked upon the Gentiles as excluded from the blessings of the gospel. Now the Lord was seeking to teach Peter the worldwide extent of the divine plan. How carefully the Lord worked to overcome the prejudice against the Gentiles that had been so firmly fixed in Peter's mind by his Jewish training. By the vision of the sheet and its contents he sought to divest the Apostles' mind of this prejudice and to teach the important truth that in heaven there is no respect of persons, that Jew and Gentile are alike precious in God's sight, that through Christ the heathen may be made partakers of the blessings and privileges of the Gospel. It was with reluctance at every step that Peter undertook the duty laid upon him but he dared not disobey. As Peter pointed Cornelius and his kinsmen and friends, to Jesus as the sinner's only hope, he himself understood more fully the meaning of the vision he had seen, and his heart glowed with the spirit of the truth that he was presenting. When the brethren in Judea heard that Peter had gone to the house of a Gentile and preached to those assembled, they were surprised and offended. They feared that such a course, which looked to them presumptuous, would have the effect of counteracting his own teaching. Peter laid the whole matter before them. Convinced that Peter's course was in direct fulfillment of the plan of God, and that their prejudices and exclusiveness were utterly contrary to the spirit of the gospel, they glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety, that the Lord has sent his angel, and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod. The day of Peter's execution was at last appointed, but still the prayers of the believers ascended to heaven. 
And while all their energies and sympathies were called out in fervent appeals for help, angels of God were watching over the imprisoned apostle. Herod on this occasion had taken double precautions. To prevent all possibility of release, Peter had been put under the charge of sixteen soldiers, who, in different watches, guarded him day and night. In his cell, he was placed between two soldiers, and was bound by two chains, each chain being fastened to the wrist of one of the soldiers. He was unable to move without their knowledge. With the prison doors but man's extremity is God's opportunity. Herod was lifting his hand against omnipotence, and he was to be utterly defeated. By the putting forth of his might. God was about to save the precious life that the Jews were plotting to destroy. A mighty angel is sent from heaven to rescue Peter. The principalities and powers of heaven are watching the warfare which, under apparently discouraging circumstances, God's servants are carrying on. New conquests are being achieved, new honors won, as the Christians, rallying round the banner of their Redeemer, go forth to fight the good fight of faith. All the heavenly angels are at the service of the humble, believing people of God, and as the Lord's army of workers here below sing their songs of praise, the choir above join with them in ascribing praise to God and to His Son. Every true child of God has the cooperation of heavenly beings. Invisible armies of light and power attend the meek and lowly ones who believe and claim the promises of God. Cherubim and seraphim, and angels that excel in strength, stand at God's right hand, all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him, and delivers them. The Experience of Philip Directed by an angel from heaven to go to the place where he met one seeking for truth, of Cornelius, visited by an angel with a message from God, of Peter, in prison and condemned to death, led by an angel forth to safety, all show the closeness of the connection between heaven and earth. To the worker for God the record of these angel visits should bring strength and courage. Today, as verily as in the days of the apostles, heavenly messengers are passing through the length and breadth of the land, seeking to comfort the sorrowing, to protect the impenitent, to win the hearts of men to Christ. We cannot see them personally, nevertheless they are with us, guiding, directing. Protecting Heaven is brought near to earth by that mystic ladder, the base of which is firmly planted on the earth, while the topmost round reaches the throne of the infinite. Angels are constantly ascending and descending this ladder of shining brightness, bearing the prayers of the needy and distressed to the Father above, and bringing blessing and hope, courage and help, to the children of men. These angels of light create a heavenly atmosphere about the soul, lifting us toward the unseen and the eternal. We cannot behold their forms with our natural sight. The spiritual ear alone can hear the harmony of heavenly voices. God commissions His angels to save His chosen ones from calamity, to guard them from the pestilence that walks in darkness and the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Again and again have angels talked with men as a man speaks with a friend, and led them to places of security. Again and again have the encouraging words of angels renewed the drooping spirits of the faithful and, carrying their minds above the things of earth, caused them to behold by faith the white robes, the crowns, the palm branches of victory, which overcomers will receive when they surround the great white throne. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? With the faith and experience of the Galilean disciples who had accompanied with Jesus were united, in the work of the Gospel, the fiery vigor and intellectual power of a rabbi of Jerusalem. A Roman citizen, born in a Gentile city, a Jew, not only by descent but by lifelong training, patriotic devotion, and religious faith, educated in Jerusalem by the most eminent of the rabbis, and instructed in all the laws and traditions of the fathers, Saul of Tarsus shared to the fullest extent the pride and the prejudices of his nation. While still a young man, he became an honored member of the Sanhedrin. He was looked upon as a man of promise. A zealous defender of the ancient faith. In the theological schools of Judea the word of God had been set aside for human speculations, it was robbed of its power by the interpretations and traditions of the rabbis. 
With their fierce hatred of their Roman oppressors, they cherished the determination to recover by force of arms their national supremacy. The followers of Jesus, whose message of peace was so contrary to their schemes of ambition, they hated and put to death. In this persecution, Saul was one of the most bitter and relentless actors. At the gate of Damascus the vision of the crucified one changed the whole current of his life. The persecutor became a disciple, the teacher a learner. The days of darkness spent in solitude at Damascus were as years in his experience. The Old Testament scriptures stored in his memory were his study, and Christ his teacher. Paul did not think that he made any real sacrifice when he exchanged Phariseeism for the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul found that he was in a wrong path, he linked himself. According to divine light, with a people he had thought he must wipe from the earth. He taught Christ and lived Christ, and suffered martyrdom for Christ's sake. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. In the wonderful conversion of Paul we see the miraculous power of God. Jesus, whose name of all others he most hated and despised, revealed himself to Paul for the purpose of arresting his mad yet honest career, that he might make this most unpromising instrument a chosen vessel to bear the gospel to the Gentiles. The light of heavenly illumination had taken away Paul's eyesight. But Jesus, the great healer of the blind, does not restore it. He answers the question of Paul in these words, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Jesus could not only have healed Paul of his blindness, but he could have forgiven his sins and told him his duty by marking out his future course. From Christ all power and mercies were to flow, but he did not give Paul an experience, in his conversion to truth, independent of his church recently organized upon the earth. The marvelous light given Paul upon that occasion astonished and confounded him. He was wholly subdued. This part of the work man could not do for Paul, but there was a work still to be accomplished which the servants of Christ could do. Jesus directs him to his agents in the church for a further knowledge of duty. Thus he gives authority and sanction to his organized church. Christ had done the work of revelation and conviction, and now Paul was in a condition to learn of those whom God had ordained to teach the truth. Christ directs Paul to his chosen servants, thus placing him in connection with his church. The very men whom Paul was purposing to destroy were to be his instructors in the very religion that he had despised and persecuted. An angel is sent to Ananias, directing him to go to a certain house where Saul is praying to be instructed in what he is to do next. In Christ's stead Ananias touches his eyes that they may receive sight, in Christ's stead he lays his hands upon him, prays in Christ's name, and Saul receives the Holy Ghost. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, and returned again unto Damascus. Paul's life was in peril. And he received a commission from God to leave Damascus for a time. He went into Arabia, and there, in comparative solitude, he had ample opportunity for communion with God and for contemplation. He wished to be alone with God, to search his own heart, to deepen his repentance, and to prepare himself by prayer and study to engage in a work which appeared to him too great and too important for him to undertake. He was an apostle, not chosen of men, but chosen of God, and his work was plainly stated to be among the Gentiles. While in Arabia he did not communicate with the apostles, he sought God earnestly with all his heart, determining not to rest till he knew for a certainty that his repentance was accepted and his great sin pardoned. He would not give up the conflict until he had the assurance that Jesus would be with him in his coming ministry. He was ever to carry about with him in the body the marks of Christ's glory, in his eyes, which had been blinded by the heavenly light, and he desired also to bear with him constantly the assurance of Christ's sustaining grace. Paul came into close connection with heaven, and Jesus communed with him, and established him in his faith bestowing upon him his wisdom and grace. All who are under the training of God need the quiet hour for communion with their own hearts, with nature, and with God. They need to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear Him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed, and in quietness we wait before Him, 
the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Amidst the hurrying throng, and the strain of life's intense activities, he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. He will receive a new endowment of both physical and mental strength. His life will breathe out a fragrance, and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts.